We are often quick to dismiss folklore, myths and legends as imaginative and untrue stories that were created in a time when storytelling would easily fill the gaps between fact and fiction when recounting the strange and unexplained, deceiving listeners away from the truth that we've since answered through logical explanations in modern science. However, today's story is enduring throughout history and is still insufficiently explained by science. And we'll touch on the legend of this global phenomenon of ghost lights that has been reported for well over a century. There is a mysterious light in the outback of Australia that is sometimes described as an orange speck and other times a big white ball. Sometimes it's close and sometimes it follows you. Sometimes it just hovers away in the distance. It's been called a ghost light, a spirit orb, and in later years, all manner of scientific sounding natural phenomena. Some of those people have seen it would explain it as this. You know you don't follow the Min Min lights or you'll get lost. But you wanted to. Everything in your body was telling you to go to it, go towards it and see what it was. This story will explore the history of this legend as it continues to be explored in the remote outback with encounters ranging from the mysterious to the terrifying. Mysterious ghost lights drifting across the landscape are a global phenomena represented in folklore such as America's jack-o'-lanterns, the Celtic will-o'-the-wisp, Mexico's Brugia, South America's Luz Mala, and have been similarly seen in Australia since the beginning of white settlement and in earlier indigenous culture, but the Min Min is the most notable and became the namesake for all such similar encounters. Min Min is an Aboriginal word with its origin meaning lost in time. However, what we do know about the light is that it was not named by the Aborigines. It takes its name from the first notably being reported in the vicinity of the Min Min Hotel, which is located on the Old Coach Road between Winton and Bullia in central western Queensland. Built in the early 1880s, the Min Min Hotel was a stopover for the Cobb Co, which was a stagecoach service carrying passengers and mail to various remote areas of the Australian outback. It had a well-established reputation for hardship and moral corruption, and its patrons were equally hard people with many who went on to find their eternal home in the cemetery behind the hotel, one of many scattered throughout the sparse region. But the Min Min Hotel had a reputation for being the worst. In the old rough days, the hotel was famed for its wild boardiness and its gut-rotting drinks that were especially mixed by the publican without the slightest consideration to responsible services of alcohol practices. Many a shearer with a big check drank himself to death at the infamous hotel, or was killed in a drunken brawl, or maybe murdered for his money, and the corpses of many of those customers who received preferential treatment were tossed into the cemetery out the back. The Min Min Hotel was no titty twister, but its vicious dust to dawn reputation led many to believe the ghost of the Min Min was an uneasy soul looking to settle old scores, or perhaps looking for one last swig of that fiery drink that led to its untimely death. One of the first hotel keepers, William Lilly, buried his wife in 1897 across the creek from the hotel site. William would go on to manage the hotel until 1912, when he handed over to Jane McMillan, who seemed to have had simply disappeared a short while after, possibly also buried out the back. And by 1915, Agnes Haystead had taken over the hotel, living there with her son Lionel, with the newspaper reports referring to the hotel as a shanty, giving the appearance of it being somewhat disreputable. Agnes had lived a difficult and tumultuous life. She'd risen from her youth as a domestic servant in the UK before emigrating to Australia with her brother, Harry Springthorpe, where she somehow transitioned into a career of breeding cattle in the region. She had a first dealing with death near the Min Min Hotel when she first helped the owner William Lilly during the tragic death of his wife in 1897 and then shortly after her brother-in-law was all over the newspapers having murdered his wife with a shotgun to the head while she slept alongside their children and then attempted to take his own life with a knife to the throat. This crime alone highlights the insanity of crime and punishment during the era, with the jury recommending leniency to his claim of diminished responsibility following revelation of her adultery. Death would follow Agnes with her first personal blow in 1898 when her nine-year-old son was lost at Thompson's Tank, which is next door to the Min Min Hotel. This was yet another horrific incident with her son unexpectedly going missing, only to be found barely alive, but so badly eaten by ants that he perished on the way to medical assistance in the closest town of Bullia. Agnes ran the Min Min Hotel from 1915 with the assistance of a girl named Mary Matheson who vanished in 1916, who was perhaps also taking up permanent residency in one of the graves out the back. It was during this time that the hotel had gained a reputation whereby one of the ladies would make sure that the menfolk were always comfortable during their stay. With the disappearance of Mary, Agnes's daughter-in-law Gladys joined her in the running of the hotel. And then again tragedy stuck when Agnes's brother, who she'd immigrated with from the UK, Harry Springthorpe, was mortally injured by fire in a nearby cattle station in 1917. 
His burial place remains unknown, but the fact that Agnes had a private graveyard behind her hotel and that he was her only sibling in the area gives the possibility that he's also perhaps resting in one of the unmarked graves. Only a few years later, in February 1924, fire destroyed Agnes's Min Min Hotel, leaving nothing but ruins and graves. And in 1953, Agnes passed away and was buried alongside the Hamilton Hotel, which was an establishment operated by a son right next door to the remnants of the Min Min Hotel. So to pause and assess, we have now set the scene for a reputably nasty and remote hotel with a well-stocked graveyard at the back. And this just happens to be the very place where the Min Min lights were first reportedly seen. Sightings of mysterious lights began with a stockman who was riding at about 10pm on a cloudy night and passed close to the Min Min Hotel graveyard. Now these stockmen were not the sort of men to be easily spooked in the dark of night. However, his attention was suddenly drawn in the direction of a strange glow in the middle of the cemetery. It got bigger until it was about the size of a watermelon and at that point he became really unnerved, breaking out into a cold sweat as this strange light started coming towards him. There was absolutely no reasonable explanation for what he was witnessing and he was feeling understandably scared. Responding by digging his boot spurs into his horse and heading in the direction of town as fast as he could go and at times looking back over his shoulder only to see the light following him until it disappeared just outside of town. Another notable encounter of the Min Min Light was published 25 years later submitted by Henry Lamont in the April 1937 issue of Walkabout magazine. Henry was a manager of Warenda Station, the same land where the Min Min Hotel stood. His story took place in 1912, by which time the original Min Min Hotel publican, William Lilly, had already spent many years stacking bodies in the cemetery at the back. Henry told the story of a dark wintry June morning when he set off at about 2am for a neighbouring property at Slashes Creek, where he planned to start the landmarking. He rode his mare 8-10 to 10 miles out onto the downs that night, which was nothing out of the ordinary for an experienced bushman. It was partway through this journey that he saw what he initially thought to be the headlight of an approaching car. Now in 1912, cars, although they were not common, were certainly not rare, and this seemed like a reasonable assumption to Henry. Unperturbed, he took note of the thing and continued to sing as he rode, and even taking a moment to estimate the strength of the approaching light by the way it picked out the individual hairs on his mare's mane. But then as the light drew closer, Henry realised it was not a car light at all. It remained in one bulbous ball instead of dividing into two headlights, which it should have done as it came closer, and it was too green glary for an acetylene light, also floating too high for any car. He didn't know exactly what it was, but he could tell there was something eerie about it. He would describe the light as floating as airily as a bubble, moving with a comparative slowness and estimated that it was moving at about 10 miles per hour, at a height of about 5 to 10 feet above the ground, with its size comparable to a new risen moon. The light continued to approach and proved itself not to be an early morning figment of Henry's imagination, with his mare pulling up short as it approached, pricking her ears up and snorting her challenge to what was the unknown. It was a minor anomaly to the mare and she began moving again, and he and the light passed each other, moving in opposite directions. Curious, he turned to watch it just as it began to melt away, noting it did not go out with a snap, but was more like the gradual fading of wires in an electric bulb, and the mare acknowledged the disappearance with another snorting whistle. He'd never experienced such a peculiar light encounter, and Henry concluded that the luminous globe must have been from gas rising from a mud spring, likely not realising for a moment that what he'd just seen would leave some of the most intelligent people still searching for a rational explanation of the Min Min lights over one century later. These sightings of mysterious ghost lights from the early 1900s have consistently been reported within the Min Min region and elsewhere throughout remote areas of Australia, to the point where there have simply been so many sightings that it would not be possible to cover them all here. And these witnesses are typically credible people, including cattle station staff, policemen, ministers of religion, teachers, shopkeepers, butchers, bakers and candlestick makers, as well as travelling tourists who continue to report sightings in the present day, with stories of seeing the light following their caravans and campers, later stopping to boil some water in readiness to offer a warm cup of coffee to the right of the motorcycle that they think is approaching. But just like the ball of light that rose up from the Min Min Hotel Cemetery that night, their descriptions remain much the same as round or oval balls of glowing light that are so bright they illuminate the surrounding area as they travel parallel to the ground at heights of between about 1 and 2 metres sometimes pausing to stop and hover, described as behaving intelligently before usually diving down towards the earth and disappearing. So what could it be? Well, the lights have been so widely reported that their existence is undisputed, but the theories about what they actually are has been wide-ranging since the early days of the Min Min Hotel, with some patrons believing it was the spirits of the dead, while other early skeptics claim it was a light caused by fluorescent fungi, or from birds that have brushed their wings up against such fungi, or perhaps even fireflies or swarms of moths, with their wings reflecting the moonlight, but none of these biological creatures could replicate the appearance and behaviour of the light's luminosity or pattern of movement. The men and women of science would go on to propose that the ghost lights were simply the sightings of Ignis Fatus, 
which simply means foolish four, and attributes the strange luminescence to marsh gas or methane, or known as swamp gas, which seems to be the explanation of all things unexplained, with ignis fatus also aligned to phosphorated hydrogen, which occurs from the gas that escapes from dead things such as animals, or overcrowded cemeteries behind debaucherous outback hotels. So as the Min Min Light was said to have originated in the cemetery behind the hotel, the presence of phosphorated hydrogen was possible during that period, but the environment is far too arid to produce marsh gas. Furthermore, all theories about the gas fueled illumination rely on the premise that the gas somehow self-ignites, which is impossible. The most widely accepted scientific explanation can be attributed to the neuroscientist Professor Jack Pettigrew, who concluded the light was the result of a Fata Morgana, which is the inverted mirage where the image of a distant bright light is carried on cold, dense layers of air, with the region of the mimin naturally creating the ideal conditions for producing such cold night air. Professor Pettigrew referred to similar examples to demonstrate his theory, such as ships being seen floating above the ocean or the Irish coast floating above the calm Atlantic and observed more than 1,000 kilometers from land. Now this theory has been replicated and proven to project light over great distances, but it falls short of explaining those up close encounters which display the remarkable behaviours of the Min Min Light, as Henry Lamont observed late that night when passed by the light with his horse. Documentary filmmaker Don Miz created the critically acclaimed 2019 film The Search for the Min Min, which explored the Fata Morgana theory proposed by Professor Pettigrew and noted the prevalence of cool night air was diminishing in the Min Min region because of climate change, which would correlate to the significant drop-off in Min Min sighting reports in recent decades. His research concluded that the Fata Morgana effect can explain a lot, but not all encounters, noting there is still an outlying percentage that is simply unexplained. There has also been reports of video footage captured in recent years of a rare phenomena, referred to as ball lightning, which although somewhat similar in appearance, ultimately behaves like lightning and quickly dissipates after a relatively short period of time compared to the Min Min. Now I must acknowledge this has been a down and dirty introduction of the phenomena known as the Min Min Lights and what I've covered hardly scratches the surface. If you know of other stories of ghost lights, I'd love to hear about them. But in the meantime, be curiously wary of mysterious lights in the outback and I'll see you next time.